Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Were you, did you find yourself uh, impacted at all by the news of the week? Well, yeah, I was. I think it was a, a tragic loss in uh, the music industry. Not so much the film industry. All right. Sorry. T too soon. I know. Sorry. Jerk. No, I. <laughs> you are talking to somebody who was moved. I know. No, I I think it was a huge loss. I really do. Yeah. 
It was a huge it's very talking about very it. disappointing. And in a year of big musical yeah. like sadness, this is uh this is like I don't know, it's like the second really big one. Yeah. I guess it depends on your perspective, but I, David Bowie and Prince seem like the two big ones for me. Yeah, they really uh, really huge. I Pr- Prince was the definitely the the more impactful one for me. I mean, he was right up there in the just because, you know, I mean, when you're a kid in those formative years, like you you become a fan of of an artist at the level of just like really you're a f- hooligan fandom. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had I had the uh, jean jacket with the bejeweled shoulder uh like he did in in purple rain i mean his was a purple i had i had friends who went even further than that with the bejeweled shoulders on actual purple like raincoats i didn't i didn't have a, a purple raincoat or you bet i would have done that <laughs> uh but you you know I, I spent a lot of years collecting bootlegs prince bootlegs and vinyl and i i just um yeah, this was a tough uh it was a tough week mostly because you know anytime you you run into this i think where you've had that sort of fan relationship with somebody for so many years, yeah, you just can't help but 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 have it sort of shake your sense of mortality. Uh, and and suddenly, fifty seven years old is it's not that old, you know. No, yeah. Well, that's have, the thing that really shocks you is it's like, gosh, it's just so young, and yeah, uh, I don't know. It does really kind of wake you up a little bit. Alarmingly close to where I am right now in my life. Alarmingly close. Uh, and I still contend that, uh, and it's funny, the, I don't know, maybe it's just because of the thing, but I've been listening to uh, to Parade, the, the soundtrack from Under the Cherry Moon. Obviously, we did the show on Under the Cherry Moon. The, the movie did not hold up well uh, when we watched it again. And uh, But the music uh, absolutely does, and I find it is it has been wildly appropriate, uh, a soundtrack for the week. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. That's really good. That's it. That's my, I actually, I listened to uh, some of the songs from the Batman soundtrack, and you, I I quite enjoyed them. I really you, just <laughs> those are really fun songs. They are. It's a great soundtrack. It's a super <laughs> fun. Hey, did you listen to uh, to the Bat Dance? The, yes, I did. That's a yeah. good one. Bat yeah. Dance. Yeah. This town needs, needs an, an enema. enema. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was good. That's a good soundtrack. I uh, I've been listening to. Uh, there are a number of quintessential bootlegs like if you want the the very best bootleg, and these are not that hard to find but if you if you really want the best bootleg, you look for the uh uh it's like uh, minneapolis uh 32187 or small club uh that you can find um and they are absolutely incredible demonstrations not just of, of prince the performer but prince the musician i mean he was a phenomenally talented uh, uh, instrumentalist, multi, multi, multi instrumentalist, and and to hear him uh, go to town on in some in in a way that you don't hear him in in some of his label released albums or his, his independently released like official albums, um, it, it's a real treat. The one that I've been loving this week uh, of the bootlegs is crucial, which is uh, Prince with a number of tracks that he did with Miles Davis. Uh, apparently, Prince and Miles Davis had a, a healthy mutual respect for one another, and and never, as far as I know, never released anything official. Uh, but Crucial has a number of tracks. There, there was uh, one, Little Red Riding Hood, or or can I? I can't remember what it. It's been released under two uh, titles that, uh, and and they're on this Crucial bootleg. So these are these are things that are pretty easy to find on the internet, and um, and if you want to hear some great Prince start with those that's it awesome awesome yeah i have no other stories because i've been in mourning i have one i mean it doesn't hold any weight compared to prince <laughs> but uh but i finally watched uh, uh spotlight oh so we're gonna do that right now <laughs> no we don't have to you loved it tell me you loved it it's absolutely worthy of all of the oscar praise that it got i enjoyed it Ugh, i did, I did I'm enjoy snoozing it. already <laughs> it would not have been my pick for best picture, but I did enjoy the. Would you do you I support, found it, however, actually, that it was nominated? Are you because I it would not have been yeah. my pick for being nominated? No, I thought it was fine being nominated. I I was completely engrossed from beginning to end. <laughs> I must have slept through that part. You must have <laughs> the beginning all two to hours end of part. It. <laughs> 
Well, that's no. all we really have to say about that. All right. <laughs> Sorry, we yeah. don't ever have to bring it up again <laughs> unless one of our guests brings it to the show and wants is to it, talk about it. Is it ironic that we'll never bring it up day. again? We will never speak of this again. <laughs> Andy, you're going to go home and you're never going to speak of this again. <laughs> Spotlight. <laughs> Demonstrating that you learn nothing from the moral of that story. <laughs> Woo, man. Oh, Nothing man. like spotlight to to uh liven a party about Prince. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, jeez. I say we tell the people where we're from. Yes, where are we from? This is the next reel on Rashpixel.fm, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, Rennie Harlan is at the helm of the next in our Shane Black series with his 1996 film, The Long Kiss Goodnight. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us over at thenextreel.com. You can subscribe to the show directly wherever fine podcasts are served, or YouTube, or you know what else? We have an email list. I don't think we've ever mentioned that on the show, as demonstrated by the number of people who subscribe to it. (laughs) But we do have an email list. You can subscribe to the email list, and I don't know what we're going to send out to it. I don't know. So It'll It'll be be a big surprise. It is. It's a glorious experiment uh, uh, on both of our parts. So that's very exciting. Of course, you can engage with us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel and... Remember that time when we all got together and amnesia, 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 hashtag pony prize, hashtag guess the movie challenge. And with that, let's head on over to Scotland and tie Games Master Stephen Smart to a water wheel where we can dunk him underwater over and over again until he spills the beans on who won this week's challenge. Hey guys, this week we stay in the 80s with Stir Crazy from 1980s, directed by Sidney Poitier and starring Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. At Fegfe nailed it two images in. So congrats again at Fegfe, you are entered into the 2016 Pony Prize hat for the seventh time. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday. So thanks guys, and see you later. We've got a blot spot. Uh, good Ben Lott has written in with his feedback on The Last Boy Scout. I think we're closer this week, right? Getting there. We're getting there. I really love Bruce Willis in The Last Boy Scout. He knows how to perfectly play that washed-up detective whose entire life is falling apart. You guys said that Wayans was bad casting, but I'd say he was playing a character who was altogether pointless. I literally cannot think of one single scene that required his presence. It's as if Shane Black is so comfortable with buddy movies that he threw in this useless character just so he could keep his streak going and Willis wasn't left alone. The villain's plan is convoluted and stupid, and I'll agree that one less villain would have helped. It's unfortunate that the movie never quite lived up to the potential of that opening scene. Your rank 231, my rank 178. All right, well... I yeah. will agree with what, uh, what he says about Wayans. I don't think it's that Wayans is bad here. I just don't think that the part was written well. I think it's, uh, I don't know. I feel like there was some more stuff in the script with some more of his depression and uh, made the character make a little more sense. And I just, I, I feel like here he wasn't really given a lot. I agree with that. It's, it's kind of a forced buddy comedy. Yeah, it's a force buddy comedy in the way that he's he's a character that probably would have been better served as a client of Bruce Willis than a than a partner, and that felt a little forced. But I still contend that Wayans was was not right for the part, even a useless part. He wasn't able to make you know to to uh, uh, to make a go of it in my my book. So yeah, there you go. All right, Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think I should go first because I want to get mine out of the way because I'm mostly excited for yours. Okay. <laughs> is, that, is that not good enough reason? No, it's great. I love it. Uh, so I, it's sort of weird that I'm bringing up a movie that's about McDonald's. <laughs> Did you find yourself moved by that? Why is that weird? I don't know. It every every, like strange... every American Olympic athlete supports McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, uh, this is the, it's called The Founder. It is a biopic of the founder, uh, we'll say roughly the founder of uh, McDonald's, Ray Kroc, played by Michael Keaton, directed by John Lee Hancock, written by Robert Siegel. Uh, Stars Michael Keaton, obviously, Patrick Wilson, and Linda Cardellini. Oh, Linda Cardellini. I do like Linda. Uh, This is a, a fascinating, fascinating story. I don't know what 
to make of the movie. Obviously, haven't seen it. The trailer looks great. I think Michael Keaton looks great in it. Uh, the story of McDonald's is amazing. And outside of, you know, MBA circles and case study circles about Ray Kroc, I'm not sure how many people actually understand the mechanics of the business of McDonald's, or, or at least how many people have given it much thought. But it is amazing what this company does. So, uh, you know, if you want to do some prep work for this film, uh, read Fast Food Nation, learn a little bit about uh, Carl's Jr. and Wendy's and, and more about McDonald's and understand what the underlying business model is. And then this trailer and this film, I think, will make a grand impact on our impression of the business of fast food. I think it looks, uh, I think it tells an important story. Uh, and so on that regard, I'm really looking forward to it. Once again, uh, this is another trailer with a terrific uh, song in it. This is Barnes Courtney's Glitter and Gold, uh, which is a, as a, a, a whew, dark country song uh, that backs uh, Michael Keaton's Ray Kroc. I think it's a fantastic uh, uh, visual and oral treat. Uh, what do you uh, what do you think of it? I am really excited. I I saw that they were making a movie about the founder of McDonald's. I'm like, well, that's kind of odd. I mean, I I knew like Ray Kroc. You know, the whole foundation of the company was the real estate. I knew that, but I had no idea like this darker side of Ray Kroc. Like you know, kind of swiping it from these other guys. Everything. It looks like a really interesting story. And I'm really excited to see it. I think it sounds like a, fan, a fascinating character tale. And I, uh, you know, I some people aren't huge fans of John Lee Hancock, but you know, I think the guy's done some good stuff. So I am, uh, I'm very interested in this one. I think so too. Uh, John Lee Hancock. I mean, we we you know, Snow White and the Huntsman, The Blind Side. Uh, you know, the big one for me was Saving Mr. Banks. Yeah, uh, which was just terrific. Uh, and I really point. liked The Rookie. I thought that was yep, a good yep. movie too. Yep, absolutely. So I think there's a lot to be said for the the team that is putting this together. I don't know a whole lot about uh, worldwide release dates, but I know it's hitting the U.S. August 5th, Sweden, October 7th, November 3rd, the Netherlands and Brazil in December. So, um, you know, it's coming around. But this this should be an interesting one to check out. August 5th. What's yours? It's exciting because it's going to be a part of our series coming up later this fall. It'll be a part of the Seven Samurai Family series. And that's going to be the remake of The Magnificent Seven, which is interesting because The Magnificent Seven, of course, was an American remake of The Seven Samurai. So here we have a remake of a remake, which <laughs> I think is an interesting way to go. But I It am actually really... never ends when you start <laughs> watching it. It's just as a recursive loop <laughs> right. of movie. Oh, it's, it makes me laugh. But yeah. this is Antoine Fuqua's take on the Western. And it's got Denzel Washington leading the charge, the group of seven. Um, I love the story. You know, this uh, this group of villagers who are uh, uh, downtrodden by this um, awful uh, gangster who lives near them and uh, who always is, you know, stealing their stuff. And so they go and hire these uh, these cowboys to come and save them. And these seven cowboys join up and, of course, uh, work hard to save the village. It's a story that may sound familiar because it has been remade in lots of different ways. But, of course, this is the the Magnificent Seven. And it's going to be a kick-ass cowboy movie uh, with Denzel Washington, Vincent D'Onofrio, Chris Pratt, uh, Matt Bomer, Ethan Hawke, Peter Sarsgaard, Vinnie Jones. Uh, it's got just a, a wonderful, wonderful cast. And... I think it looks really fun. I'm a little, I'm a little torn if it's going to be um, just another kind of feeling like just another remake sort of thing, or if the cast is really going to somehow tie it together so it actually feels very much like a stronger version of the story. So uh, yeah, so I'm excited. And speaking of your trailer uh, beforehand, John Lee Hancock had a hand in writing the screenplay for this one. Go figure. Uh, and, uh, you know, Peter Skarsgård is in it. And if you squint, he kind of looks like Michael Keaton. <laughs> right. Coincidences abound. Here's the it's thing. Amazing. Uh, amazing. Uh, Ethan Hawke is in it. And uh, obviously, I don't know, I have a weird affection with Ethan Hawke only because of his schedule. <laughs> right, because uh, he seems yet, to make five movies a year. <laughs> it's yet another. Uh, this will be the fifth Yep. Uh, of uh, of his so far. Uh, he's just a crazy busy dude. But the reason that I'm going to see this movie, apart from it being in our series, the reason I'm going to see this movie is because of Chris Pratt. And I think that is telling. 
right? That, it's a Chris. He's, it's a Chris yeah. Pratt vehicle. At this point, because of uh, the choices that he's made with some of his movies, pretty much anything that he's going to be in is going to become a Chris yes. Pratt vehicle. Yes. Absolutely. So I, I think that he, he, uh, he has done something with his career uh, very, very quickly, and, and he, hasn't see, he doesn't seem to be uh, flaming out. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing this. He seems to be making some good choices. And on top of that, Vincent D'Onofrio, uh, after his turn as Kingpin in Daredevil Season 1, uh, I, he, he can do precious little wrong for me right now. So I, I can't wait to see him in this again as Jack Horn. Uh, and, you know, Denzel can't, can't go really wrong with, uh, with Denzel just for imitation fodder alone. And I like that Byung Hun Lee is in it also, yeah. As uh, as one of the the cowboys too, as Billy Rocks, and of course he was uh, wasn't he Snake Eyes? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. When does it hit? This one opens uh, September 23rd, so this is going to be uh, just in time for our series, and it's pretty uh, almost universal across the world as far as that date. Between the 22nd and the 29th, it's opening, All right. but here in the U.S., it will be the 23rd. And you you keep saying I this and I that like, well, it's like you don't need me anymore. Hello, girls. Caitlin, come help me in the kitchen. Hurry up, cause I forget where it is. That's her mom. She's got amnesia. <laughs> what if you couldn't remember your real name, your first kiss, or your last goodbye? I don't remember. Honey, you have an ETA on that cure. And then suddenly, I used to do this. I'm a chef. No! Without warning, give me something else. Sorry, oh, no. All your memories, name's Charlie. I'm coming back. Came flooding back to you. Isn't Charlie? All the time. One bullet at a time. We got movement on Samantha Kane. Good. I may have a lead on someone. We still have some of her stuff. <laughs> This man is going to help me find some things out, so we'll be safe. Your full name is Charlene Elizabeth Baltimore. This could be trouble. Oh, Rennie Harlan. Rennie? Rennie Harlan. Is he, the, he's, is he the most famous thing to come out of, uh, uh, come out of Finland? I don't know. Is he? I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to make any promises, but he was, uh, you know, he was a pretty big name out of Finland. This is the Long Kiss Goodnight, Andy, and uh, from 1996, and it stars Gina Davis, and it stars Samuel L. Jackson, and it is a a fresh spring rain compared <laughs> to the last two movies that we have done in this Shane Black series. I expected so much more from the Shane Black series, and uh, I feel like finally I got what I expected out of this Yeah. Film. I, uh, this film, I just, I mean, ever since I first saw it, this has really been kind of just a, a, a I mean, a, a, I want to say it's a guilty pleasure because I feel like it didn't get the attention or the the, the care that uh, I feel it deserves. So I feel like I'm kind of on an island as far as my love for this movie. But man, I think this, this, this takes all of the kind of the ridiculous over the top, uh, like bloody comedy and everything that I think works so well and and it, it it does it all in a way that is is right i think my problem with some of the previous um stuff in the last two films we've talked about is that some of the uh the tone just feels a little jarring like i feel like there's a lot of that family angle in lethal weapon that never really balanced with me with like the the dark suicidal tendencies side of the story um i struggled with that in that movie um, and maybe it boiled down to the directing, uh, or maybe it was just Shane Black hadn't quite matured enough as a writer. Um, certainly had more problems with Long Kiss Goodnight. I mean, uh, the, sorry, The Last uh, Boy Scout. But here, I feel like it's not taking itself seriously. There is kind of that, the the darker side of a person who's uh, and has amnesia, who discovers, you know, that she's a cold-blooded killer. Uh, but it's all done in a very... Uh, just kind of over the top silly way and it's not taking itself seriously and it makes it really fun to watch. I think that's the balance right there is that there is enough of the film not taking itself seriously that makes it not a comedy but fun. And 
uh, it, to do some of the crazy stuff that they get away with in this film, some of the, the you know, uh, it, you know, I, I mean, you write them as as plot conveniences, right? I mean, there there are things that the film gets away with and excuses that it it sort of lobs into the audience that that we let just sort of go uh, because I think for me, I'm having a good time in this film and it it still has stuff to criticize i don't uh, i i guess i don't love it like you love it it sounds like but it is by comparison to the last boy scout which was not a fun experience uh i really enjoyed uh watching this movie and Here's an interesting thing. I remember distinctly not liking it when I saw this uh, for the first time, um, you know, in 96. I did not like it at all. Uh, I didn't. I don't have a good memory of it, and I thought it was going to be a Last Boy Scout experience for me. Um, and um, it turns out it was not. Boy, I'm glad it wasn't. Yeah. That would have been really sad. Yeah. No, it's it's just a it's it's just a um I don't know. There's something about the story of this woman who has amnesia and she's just kind of this you know, seemingly uh, She's a teacher, normal right? She's a teacher, housewife, yeah. homemaker. Right, exactly. She makes muffins, she uh you know, uh hosts parties, she's Mrs. Claus in the small town uh, Christmas parade. She just fits the bill as this small town uh homemaker, really. And uh, for her to kind of turn into this uh, this cold blooded assassin, um, this gov- not assassin but like a government agent, I think is just such a refreshing take on that type of story. And I I love that uh, I I love that Shane Black decided to do a story with a woman as one of the lead characters. I think that was a great choice because the the the. Buddy pairing, I think, had been getting a little tiresome. I mean, he had these two. He also had the uh, the last action hero. Now, granted, I mean that he was doing rewrites on that script, but it was also a buddy a buddy story between you know the detective and then a young boy. Right. So here he finally has a woman in the equation, and I think it makes so much difference. Well, it makes so much much difference. I think when you compare it, particularly to something like the Last Boy Scout. Um, where, you know, in this case, both parts were cast really well. Yes. You know, I mean, there were, these were characters that I think worked well together. The, the contrasts, the, the gender contrast, the racial contrast, the, uh, the, the skill contrast as portrayed on screen, uh, made for a really compelling pairing. Um, and and their objective contrast. I mean, the fact that uh, you know she is is paired with a, in a, in a buddy context with a guy that is um, he's a kind of a down and out PI, like he's he's a an ex con, and he's just looking to cash in on um, you know on an old case. Um, and and turns out he stumbles into something. I mean, his story is as interesting from his perspective. You know, had we seen that movie, the Samuel L. Jackson movie, where he is, you know, from his perspective, I think is just as interesting as watching Gina Davis kind of come out of her cocoon and discover who she is. So I I think this I think the the story is interesting from so many angles that it makes it um, it, it makes it really a, a fun romp. Um, the the way the uh, the gender reversal thing, though, I think is is important to note because really the film could work, and I think originally did uh, was intended to be uh, a male hero, right? Yeah, I don't know if it was intended to be, or at some point they were toying with the idea of of having uh, Shane Black rewrite it to be uh, male characters. But yeah, they 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 had talked about having some guys in there and changing that character to be a guy which i think that would have just messed it up yeah no you're right and that you the way you said it is right i misspoke you it was his idea was originally uh that uh the part was played by a woman and it was the studio that came back and said we think we should rewrite this and and put somebody like stallone or seagal in it right uh which would have been a disaster um well not a disaster it probably would have been fine but it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been as as uh, I think compelling. No, and I don't think it would have had the impact. I mean, yeah. I think there's there is something about the huge contrast in in uh, Gina Davis's character. When something we just are not seeing at the time. Yeah, I mean, I know she had been kind of. I mean, she was married to Rennie Harlan at the time. She was his action girl, and she did it in Cutthroat Island a few years before this one, uh, which was uh, probably much to both of their chagrin. Yeah. Um, but 
she had, you know, she was interested in showing that a woman could do these sorts of things. We talked about this when we uh, had our show on A League of Their Own, how Gina right. Davis has this, uh, she's created like the Gina Davis Institute as a place to show girls that uh, it's basically a place to empower young girls, right? Mm-hmm. That they can do whatever it is that they want to do. And I think it's fantastic that she's done that. And I think she's really pushed to uh, to change, you know, what she does with her choices in film. Um, like all through the 90s, she was doing that, like leave their own. She was with the baseball. And here she's doing that with this and even Cutthroat Island with what a woman can do in an action film. And she does play that, you know, the housewife here, but there's so much more to that character as she kind of gets her memories back and transfers, transitions back to uh, Charlie Baltimore. So uh, since this is obviously a um, Shane Black series, let's talk about the script. Yeah, I, uh, I I didn't get a chance to read it, but it's certainly, I, not all of it, I read a chunk of it, and it certainly is um, a little more violent and bloody. I mean, there's a, a scene midway through when she, as they're on their way to meet um, uh, Brian Cox's uh, character, um, they there there's like a police situation at a little diner some some crazy guy has taken a waitress hostage and has a gun in her mouth and all that sort of stuff she kind of clicks over in her brain and becomes uh charlie and pulls out the uh, that uh, sniper rifle that she has goes up on a hill finds the guy through the window and takes him out and the script talks about like the the brain matter landing on the grill and and uh, it's, it's it's really pretty, specific yeah it's <laughs> pretty gross um the way that it happens um so it's definitely you get some seriously um some real visceral imagery in the script but i i think that he uh again just makes a really fun read i mean he knows how to please the reader and and does stuff with his writing that just it i mean it works really well so this was of course a script that uh, shane black was paid at the time um, the most for any spec script. Um, he was paid $4 million. I, I don't know. I guess I read um, a couple different things. I read that he was paid $4 million, and then somewhere else I read he was paid $4.5 million. Um, and, and then it, it, I, I know that he got paid an extra half million because he was holding out because he didn't want to sell it to Rennie Harlan and Gina Davis because G- uh, Cutthroat Island was such a flop. And so the studio offered an additional half million and so he took that. I'd love that to, you know, oh, here's another half million. Okay, yeah, sure. Right. That, that, that'll make the decision easier. Uh-huh. For me. Just throw it in. So, yeah. So New Line Cinema uh, threw out a huge chunk of change for this. It was the most expensive spec sale at the time. It didn't get beaten by another spec script until a few years later when uh, Deja Vu was sold for $5 million, And that has still not been beaten as far wow. as spec scripts go. Yeah. Sure. Now, I, I mentioned plot conveniences, your uh, sense. What are the things in here that you feel like he gets away with as a result of the kind of movie that it is that maybe he, uh, uh, that, that maybe we, we could have done without? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if we could do without them. I, I think that they're the sorts of things that are easy to kind of just gloss over. You don't have to worry so much about. Like when the suitcase shows up. I mean, what are the odds that that perfect timing for that suitcase to show up? Um, in in Mitch's hands, just at the same time where she has that accident and and starts kind of cracking through the amnesia on her own, and so the two of them are able to come together and kind of figure everything out. It's awfully convenient that those things all happen at the same time. It is convenient, and it's kind of annoying uh, because I don't know. This is what ties me in knots. Um, we don't really need one of those things. Right. What we need is the excuse to get the characters together. And that excuse is the suitcase. We don't need her to have an accident, but it's nice to see her have the accident and to have that kind of instantaneous discovery. But we don't need it. Well, I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. I feel like you could maybe do it without, but like when when One Eye Jack comes to the house, I feel like. If she just started acting like she was this uh, trained uh, agent and she had no idea why, I yeah, think you'd I would have, have no had a harder sort of, time buying into that. Right. So so I guess what I'm saying is like you would have needed the inciting element to come as a result of getting them together 
um, you know, with the suitcase earlier. Some sort of, you know, the, the suitcase would have had to be that inciting element, or you know, yeah, maybe I it's don't, the phone call. But but we don't but have I think anything. It's the of accident. Like, yeah, you but that's what don't. I mean. Like if we didn't have the accident, you would have to have some other inciting incident to trigger a memory that comes back for her, right? I mean, you would just need that. Well, but, yeah. But that. But you're right. I mean, that piece is is the you know if you think about it too hard that's that's kind of the piece that that does like i said it ties me in knots uh, because you i feel like we don't we don't need them both and it's sort of annoying it's an annoying way to shoehorn him into the into the narrative but only if i stop and think about it well i think what uh, yeah i mean i i guess it doesn't bu- bug me too much i mean it, it certainly is convenient but i mean i i love the bit with the deer i think that having that as kind of the the method for her to start having those moments try, where where charlie is kind of finally starting to break through um i think that's really interesting having with that deer and, and seeing her snap the deer's neck and everything i think there's just a lot of really interesting <laughs> stuff going on there and um you know the suitcase that i mean obviously the suitcase has a lot of clues and that leads them to some of the other characters and i think that's that's fairly critical I guess you could get away with it not existing and she would start remembering things, but I don't know. I feel like I'm okay with the, all those pieces um, existing. I just, uh, I, I found it convenient that they all kind of came together at the exact same time. The The problem I have with the deer, and I know this is going to be totally lost on you, but the deer, it it is too reminiscent for me of Tommy Boy. Well, I, I've seen Tommy Boy. I just don't remember that part. You see what I mean? I called it. Yeah. There is a scene where the deer is in the back seat and it wakes up. Oh yeah, <laughs> they hit the deer and it wakes up. And that deer, I I swear it's like the same deer. <laughs> it's the was. same deer. It's because I mean the movies were made like a year apart. They were filming largely. At the, I imagine at the same time. Right. And and it feels very much like the same deer. So I couldn't take that scene seriously. In the That's long funny. kiss, good night. I felt like I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be more comedic, and it just no. felt like they were phoning it in. However, um, you know, you're right. It's it's a fine way. The, the neck breaking scene was particularly strong. And she yeah, kneels it's, down and breaks it's it a down. great it's a great bit. I mean, you know, in the script, I mean, when the deer comes through the windshield, let me just read a, a little bit here. But the damn thing is alive, more than alive, kicking, thrashing, squalling with pain and rage. A flailing hoof takes out Earl, kills him in less than a second, collapses his skull. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I think it's great. And then, the, I mean, this whole thing is just, I mean, this is really, let me just read this part here. This is a little long, but let me read it. Sam goes airborne, explodes through the windshield, outward bound, shower of glass, spritz of blood. And then she's flying, slow motion, end over end, we lose all sound. Silence as she tumbles, below and behind her, the sunbird noiselessly erupts, fireball, sky high. Sam floating, describes a lazy arc in midair, woomph, disappears into the snow, swallows her, leaving a silhouette. Around her, trees catch fire, burn, she lies in her impromptu sarcophagus, out of sight. The flaming deer totters from the wreck thrashing scene from a nightmare nightmare part two from the snow from the human shaped divot arises a woman of blood she stumbles from the drift toward the wreck and though it's clearly sam kane under all that crimson there's something wrong about her eyes and route to the car she kneels beside the suffering deer its flesh scorched and torn and kills it puts it away with a sharp cracking blow to the head stands eyes squirming with madness yeah that's four million dollars that's that's four million dollars script right there, baby. Yeah. That's what about? Uh, I mean, I mean, in terms of that is a great example of what we were talking about last week. The uh, the whole sense of the the Shane Black sort of um, uh, florid language um, is that uh, that pretty consistent throughout this idea that he is he's writing to ent- entertain just as much the the uh, uh, the well paid production assistant. Very much so. I mean, it's really all through here. I mean, and you know, they always say, at least nowadays in screenwriting, oh, don't put uh, the, you know, what the character's thinking into the script. Um, I find that he gets away with that in ways that are just really uh, just beautiful and clever. And it it really kind of taps into the reader's head a lot of the time. And I, I love the way that he goes about doing that. It just, it's it's very smart. I mean, it's really smart screenwriting. He understands the language. He understands um, what readers are reading. 
and how much readers have to read. And I think because of that, he's been able to uh, just kind of create a method where he um, makes it just, I mean, he really just makes it so much fun to read. Now, I I also read that uh, this was not, what, what we saw on screen was not entirely what he had intended with the original screenplay. Yeah, I mean, it had, they did bring in some people to do some rewrites on this. But I think what I uh, saw was that for the most part, they mostly went back to his script. I think that uh, a lot of the rewrites, like changing the, the, the genders of the characters and stuff like that, um, I think a lot of that stuff ended up going out the window. I know Samuel L. Jackson's character was originally a white Jewish guy, and Matthew Broderick and Richard Dreyfuss were considered, um, but before they rewrote it because Samuel L. Jackson was interested. Um, but from what I read is that for the most part, they did go back to, uh, to Black's script. And I mean, as I, as I was reading it, it really did feel very similar. If anything, it seemed like they may have toned down some of the uh, some of the dark violence, like the guy's brain splattering onto the uh, the grill and cooking with the burgers and stuff like that. Yeah. Because some of it was, I think, just probably just too much. You know, they weren't going to be able to get away with some of that stuff. Okay, so let's talk about Rennie Harlan then. So they he had, uh, obviously, we mentioned they'd come off a major flop with Cutthroat Island, which was just a terrible film. I've never seen it, and I, I feel like I should go back and watch it just to see what it is about that movie that stinks so much. Oh, yes, you absolutely should. What's your sense on Rennie Harlan? I, he is, for me, I, I mean, he's a director of kind of middling uh, horror action films. I My feel with Rennie is that he directed some films that I really like in a particular period, from 88 with Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, through... Um, uh, really this, I think, is kind of, so it's not a long period, 88 to 96, and it's really this Die Hard 2 cliffhanger and this that I enjoyed. Um, I just didn't get into much of his other stuff. I didn't I didn't care too much for it. I, I never saw Ford Fairlane um, and Cutthroat Island, like I said. And then Deep Blue Sea, I mean, some people really enjoy that film. I really didn't enjoy that film. So yeah, I think, neither. you know, yeah. And then I haven't seen a single thing that he's done since. I know we talked about uh, what was the trailer? Devil's Pass that came out a couple of years ago. Talked about that trailer. So, I, I mean, that's one that I was actually really curious about because it's based on that kind of true story and everything. I, I guess I'm curious to see. I think he's got a really interesting stamp. Like, I enjoy the way that he deals with action. I think it's very big and uh, very overt. And I really have fun kind of just watching the the bigness of what he's doing. Uh, I, I just don't think it always works all the time. I, you know, I'm with you. I haven't seen enough, but what I have seen does not give me a good uh, impression. And this film is really stands out. I, of course, I, I mean, I cliffhanger uh, with Stallone from '93. Man, yeah, I, I loved that movie when it first came out. <laughs> I just adored it. Uh, and I had a major crush on Janine Turner. And so it all worked for me. Everything about this movie worked. And then I saw it a couple of years ago and I realized just how young and stupid I was. <laughs> and see, I've only seen it the one time and yeah. I remember enjoying it, but I don't remember much about it. <laughs> What's better is I can't even remember now what the spoof was where the he's the guy's hanging off the wire like the opening scene. Well, they did it. They did in Ace Ventura, uh, the, <laughs> like the raccoon, yeah. Or something yeah, with like the that. raccoon where he drops. When the nature raccoon. calls, yeah, yep, that <laughs> that's was the beginning, was. and that's why he goes off to to bed or wherever he goes. Yes, yeah, it was better in Ace Ventura too, which says a <laughs> lot. <laughs> Uh, oh, yes. Okay, so Ronan, we've we've talked a little bit about Gina Davis. Uh, she was she was just great in the role. I think that she's perfect in this, and I I love Gina Davis in action stuff. I mean, she's just I think that she gets this attitude, this air about herself that I think um, is really fun to watch. It's 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 the same attitude that she adopts the latter half of. Um, Thelma and Louise, once she kind of, you know, things click in her mind and she kind of decides I can never go back and she's willing to go rob a store and all that sort of stuff. I love that kind of personality that she takes on. And so she does that here and I think that she's just great. And when she, you know, dyes her hair blonde and she becomes that, just that cold, uh, you know, cold agent, I just think she's perfect. The best part about Gina Davis's transformation in this film is that the it becomes, like she changes 
she she dramatically changes her persona, right? She becomes the secret agent murderess. And uh, yet the film ultimately is about her working to, uh, you know, be reunited with her daughter, to save her daughter. And at the end, she ends up getting her daughter, her daughter who is who gives that brilliant uh, turnabout uh, wake oh, up yeah. speech in the street, which is just terrific. Uh, it, it, they end up being together, but we, but she doesn't go back to the the you know strictly homemaker role. There are still signs of her being uh, a complete badass, uh, even in the very last idyllic uh, sequence when she's reunited with family. Um, and and so I just love that. I love that about how she how she plays that transformation and ultimately kind of keeps the skills that she remembers. Uh, but finds a way to unite them in her overall character. And she, and there's just moments where it's like, you know, the, the screams that she utters sometimes, like when she's coming to, or like re, her brain is re-clicking into Charlie mode as she's yeah. being dunked in the water wheel. And she's just got these just amazing guttural screams that she's doing. Or or when she's, at the end, when she's riding up the Christmas the Christmas light wire, as with the gun and she's just going up to take Timothy out. <laughs> it's like she's got these moments where she's just so intense and like she's badass in this really um uh intense way. Like you know, a way that you would never see Lara Croft do it. Like Lara Croft was just like she's just, you know, just very all business, you know. I feel like Charlie Baltimore is just like I mean she's just like a tiger ready to like rip your throat out, you know. <laughs> But what's interesting about the way Gina Davis portrays it is it's not it's not over I mean okay it's over the top just because of the kind of movie that it's in right let's just put that yes. away but it's not over the top unbelievable or spastic you know Right exactly it fits perfectly in context of the story that's being told here Right I I really like that and I think that was a that's a real gift of Gina Davis and kind of her on-screen persona and and she has a similar I, I it made me think of Beetlejuice frankly I, and just the whole the way she handles comedy is kind of the same way she handles uh action um it's it is it fits absolutely in the context of the narrative but it but not over the top in a way that's still approachable like it's still this is not a person who's gone completely you know bonkers um She's I it's she's easy to listen to. She's got a great voice for it. It's a deeper voice. It's not uh, and and so uh I think she she has kind of a a really commanding presence on screen that uh, that makes her transformation to Charlie that much more fun. And I think that it was really smart screenwriting on Black's part to include the daughter because I think that that element is really what ends up making Charlie Baltimore, um, somebody that we can really connect to. I yeah. think if she went into that last Operation Honeymoon... Just to get just, the bad guys. Right. I don't think that it would have had any of the connection that we have otherwise. It's because of that that we really feel for her. No, so. I agree with that. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson, he, uh, he lobbied to get this role. Yeah, and uh, I'm so glad that he did. I love that... I mean, it, he says that it's uh, his favorite film. Um, that he's done, which I think is uh, fascinating. I love seeing him in this uh, movie. I, and interestingly, Rennie Harlan also says it's his favorite movie that he's well, done. Well, see, this. now Rennie Harlan has a case to make there. I mean, that's yes. I, I agree with Rennie Harlan. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with Sam Jackson. <laughs> well, but I think it's it's because it's really fun. I mean, sure, you could argue Pulp Fiction. You could argue, I mean, there's a lot of things you could argue. And this yeah. was 2012, so it doesn't include anything after that when he initially said that. But I think that um, there's something that I think is just kind of fun, over the top, um, wild and crazy. And I think that his character is not just like that, what you can kind of have come to expect with this Samuel L. Jackson badass, you know, like what you get when you see him in Pulp Fiction. I mean, he really is just kind of, uh, you know, that that Jules, you know, the guy who's going to quote the Bible and kill you sort of guy, you know, and it's 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 it's. It's done in such a way in those other films where he's just really like the top of his game. Here, I mean, he really, if anything, fits more into the Bruce Willis mold from um, the last movie we talked about. Right, right. Where he really is this down and out guy. And boy, does he just get himself beaten up all to hell in this film. And I think that it's just uh, great to see that he goes through such uh, you know dark and awful places, but is able to kind of pull through and still 
help uh, fight in the end. Well, and to be fair, he goes through dark and awful places. And in the original script, he, in the original cut, he was killed. Right. What yeah. did you think of that? Would you have stood up and screamed, you can't kill Sam Jackson like the test audiences did? I don't think I would have said it because, like, you can't kill him. It's Samuel L. Jackson. Like, that to me is just, you know, nonsensical um, audience, uh, you know, fawning over an actor that they love who's mm-hmm. just who is Jules. Right. It doesn't make sense to me. However, I do think that he was in a film that was so over the top fun in in kind of the way that this film is, I do think it would have been wrong to kill him. I'm not sure. I felt like uh, it, it was I, I like that he lived and I liked the final sequence. Um, I just didn't like his the way he woke up in the car. You know, I mean, he's covered in blood. He's like, obviously, he, he is a, he's a damaged individual by that point. Oh, yeah. uh, and so I, that part, I, it took me out of the film for a little bit when I, I realized, oh, he's still alive? I could have sworn he, he lost it. That was my memory of the original show or the original film. So, you know, I, I guess I was okay losing him. That actually made for a much more interesting scene, a sequence of vengeance on, on Charlie's part, that she's now trying to rescue her daughter and uh, redeem the lost partner that she had grown quite attached to. So Yeah. I, I, that, I guess that's, uh, that's me justifying why it was originally written that way. I think in the way that the script was, where it was darker and more violent, I think it would have fit. But by, by toning some of that down and making it a little more fun on the fun side... For me, I just don't didn't think that it would have fit as well. I'm curious to read the script because the script that I have, it does have him dying on page 104. So yeah. I'm curious to see uh, how the rest of this reads. I'm going to try to read this at some point. Right. Well, how about Craig Bierko as Timothy? He was the uh, dude we just love to uh, love to hate. He's smarmy. Craig, he's really smarmy, and I, maybe that's why he bugs me so much because he's he's like not like. I mean, he's definitely 180 degrees from Taylor Negron's character in Last Boy Scout. You know, this guy is just kind of that smarmy guy who obviously uh, Charlie Baltimore kind of had a thing with anyway because uh, he impregnated her. So obviously, you know, he's smarmy and good looking and good with the ladies. And, you know, in that uh, the way that James Bond will bed the the bad lady, he's bedding the uh, the good lady. And it's just one of those weird things where I just I don't like him that much. And I, I, I kind of feel like he's just kind of, uh, you know, ugh, I just I don't know. There's something about him that bugs me. And I, I feel like it's half. I, I feel like probably it's just the way that the character is written, which I think is probably a testament to the script because i just don't like him and he's the bad guy so i guess it makes sense right this is this is a character that is written from the perspective of somebody who like was not in a frat and had an image of what a college frat guy was like and then took that frat guy and aged him appropriately and made made him a villain he is like the (laughs) the worst example of that stereotype and uh, and I agree with you. I did not like him. I thought he was terrific in this part, though. And I, I every time he smiled or smirked, uh, I thought he was great. And actually, when he looks into his, you know, what, who we know to be his daughter's eyes, that sequence yes. where she says, look into her eyes, and he stops and does it and realizes, oh, check that out. Yep. Uh, that's my daughter. I thought that was a really great moment. I think he he played that beautifully. So uh, there's a lot I, I like about his performance, Craig's performance in the film, even though you're right, I did not like the character at well, all. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think you're right. And it, I think that he bugs me because because of all of that. Like, he's the guy who probably would have, like, like picked on me in school, you know? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> But it's like you can tell because, I mean, he's got that like that great gun or knife sort of thing. Like when we first meet him, that guy's like begging him, please, not the knife. And then he just kind of stabs him. Now, it's more brutal in the script because he stabs him before his phone call. And then he just sits there while he's on the phone and watches this guy slowly die. I mean, it's pretty, pretty horrible. Uh, Yeah. But but um, but I like that. I mean, he's he definitely has that kind of that that frat guy who's gone bad sort of sort of way so he's great i mean i i think that he works well and i think what i like so much about the fact that he's the bad guy even though he's kind of working for perkins Mm -hmm. is that he is in it from the beginning and i think that was one of the problems that we had with the last uh, boy scout 
is that Taylor Negrin's character doesn't show up until like halfway through the film. And right. all of a sudden, Milo is the guy who's the bad guy now? Oh, I thought it was this other guy. And it, I, I think that that was just really poorly structured in that film. And uh, I think it was it was stronger here because we had them all from the beginning. I'm so glad you said that because that that I agree with you. I think that is what solved the too many antagonists challenge of the last film this is the fact that we we got to see them all the way through and you know in this case Craig Bierko is was joined by uh David Morse who plays the the big bad Daedalus. Daedalus. Yeah. <laughs> uh and we have Brian Cox who who plays sort of there's the the B evil story of the the CIA as as um uh and we should talk a little bit about that and and uh, uh here is Shane Black uh is he foretelling the future uh, I don't know, um, but they all play the bad guys, and they're all part of the evil organization, and, um, and and yet we are allowed to be intimate with them on the narrative level. I think early enough that it makes us, it makes the story feel complete. Uh, well, and, and that's I something we didn't get in the last Boy Scout. Yeah, and I mean Brian Cox, and I think this is one of the complaints that people had is it was a really convoluted plot. Like, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Is Doctor Waldman played by Brian Cox a good guy or a bad guy? And I think he was a good guy as far as you could say the CIA was the good side. Um, you know, he but he was the one who I think was working with Charlie, and I think that he actually was kind of a good guy as opposed to um, you know the other. CIA folks who were kind of working with Timothy to kind of create this whole scheme where they were, I mean, it's, it is really convoluted. You know, they, they're they trying to create fake terrorist attacks just so they can get extra funding is really kind of yeah. what it boils down to. It's uh, it, it's kind of a, an absurd uh, story when you really think of it. Although, yes, I don't think it's necessarily all that far off, which is frightening. Yeah, what is but, that? What is that? Who is that talking more about? You <laughs> or the cultural <laughs> gestalt? Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But I mean, but it is confusing. You know, uh, who's good and who's bad, and I think that can be one of the 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 issues that people have when they look at the film. Yeah. And uh, Brian Cox, I mean, he's great, but yeah, is he really a good guy? Is he a bad guy? I mean, he ends up dead either way. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, he's one of those characters that's. Uh, um, you're a little torn on. Although I've got to say, his intro is one of my favorites when he's talking to his sister about her dog's <laughs> need yes. to keep licking itself. <laughs> For an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Three hours. Right. So yeah, what, He says, uh, what's, uh, your dog, Alice, it and my appetite are mutually exclusive. What's wrong with the dog? It's simple. He's been licking his butthole for three straight hours. I submit to you that there's nothing there worth more than an hour's attention, and I should think that whatever he's attempting to dislodge is either gone for good or there to stay. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, pretty good. That's so good. Pretty good. Brian Cox delivers it as only Brian Cox can. Yes. And he ends up underwater with Gina Davis's hands down his pants. <laughs> as only Brian Cox could do. <laughs> That's right. And then there's David Morse yeah. playing a part way too small for him. I love David Morse. I do too. Even in parts like this where yes. it's like, why is David Morse in that part? Well, who cares? He's David Morris, and it's always great to watch him. David Morris makes for a great diabolical character, though, don't you think? Because he is so soft-spoken. Well, he um, works well because, you know, she was faking this whole marriage with him for Operation yeah. Honeymoon as, uh, you know, he was Luke and she was, uh, you know, whoever Charlie was going to be playing. Well, it was it was the character that she is, right? Like this school teacher. That was the, t- the pairing mm-hmm. when she uh, got her amnesia and became the school teacher. Um, but Didalus was really a bad character, and the fact that she resurfaced after you know he and all of his cronies attempted to kill her, I love that. I love that he seems so gentle and everything when, <laughs> when right. she gets to his place, but and immediately a, jumps into the part. Yes, right. Uh, he was just great. But we have Yvonne Zima as Caitlin Kane, the young daughter. Kid actors, I think, are really a challenge. And I, I really always especially, try to... Especially in Shane Black movies. Yes. Oh, I should say they are challenged. What he puts kids through. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. She goes through a lot in this film. She doesn't have to speak quite as uh, as uh, as roughly as the previous child yeah. did. But she goes through a lot in this film. Um, but you know, I really enjoy her. And I, I think the thing that I struggle with with kid actors is, is kids can really 
just sometimes, I mean, you really got to cast a kid who can just be the part, right? Because they have a hard time acting. Mm -hmm. And I think Caitlin um, really fits perfectly as this, as this character who's kind of conflicted about her mother and all of that stuff. I think she does a great job. And her little, her little uh, monologue to her mom to kind of snap her out of at the end is just perfect. It's so well done. I think so too. It is. She's from an acting family, right? Uh, and that threw me. She was in. Uh, she's been in a bunch of stuff, but she's been in uh, Young and the Restless. I think that was the the yeah. um, thing. But she was also her sister uh, is Madeline Rose Zima, and this is of nothing. It's not a huge. She's not a, a giant name, but she was in Heroes season four a few years ago. And I happen to be watching those episodes right now with my daughter. And so it feels like a, just a really bizarre coincidence in my head. It turns out she is part of a family of actresses. And uh, and they're all over the place in places I didn't expect. Yeah. And I was, you know, in my uh, trying to just really watch a bunch of Shane Black stuff, I also just rewatched Iron Man 3. Turns yep. out she's in that as Miss Elkridge uh, in does the she, little uh, the beauty pageant when Stan Lee is kind of voting and holds up his little 10 card. Does she have lines in that sequence? I don't even remember. remember. I don't recall. I, I don't think so. I think she just walks across the screen. The judge says something and then Stan Lee holds up mm-hmm. his card because it's we're not really paying attention to the TV. It's just kind of on. We, we flash back to it a couple of times. But yeah, right. she's on there. Uh, the other surprise in this film was, of course, Melina Kanakaridis. I, <laughs> I could say that all night. Uh, she's been in a bunch of stuff, uh, but a lot of TV and um, uh, she's made a career out of TV. But this was one of the first things that I remember seeing her in. And uh, it was uh, it was a treat. She was act- actually I take it back now that I say that she was in NYPD Blue, wasn't she before this? Um, and Guiding Light. Uh, oh, yeah, she yeah, was. That was the big place. on your watch list. Yeah. You know, Guiding Light was big in the. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't big. <laughs> it was definitely a general <laughs> hospital guy. Please. <laughs> oh man luke and laura luke and laura andy there you go it's the only story worth telling <laughs> <laughs> anyway yes but she, she was, was in it she as, was so funny as samuel l jackson's assistant no she was good yeah she was great all right uh what else do we have to talk about we talked about uh, in terms of it getting made we this was uh, obviously a big script for him uh, uh any other notes that we need to talk about in terms of production um you know i they a house burned down. They were filming in historic Windermere House in Muskoka, up in Canada, I believe, and uh, the place actually burned down. And it was never proved if it was a film thing or not. If one of the lights flick or flickered and burned something and set the whole place afire, but um, that was a little bit of a setback during the production. Um, so yeah, that was uh, not exactly something that um, they would have liked. But I don't have a whole lot of other stories. I mean, it's something that um, I-, I think got made a lot smoother than uh, The Last Boy Scout. That one was the one with all the trouble. Mm -hmm. This one, for the most part, I mean, like I said, you know, New Line had its ideas about where they should take it. But luckily, I think Rennie Harlan was much more on Shane Black's uh, uh, side when uh, the story came to get told. Uh, Cinematography, Guillermo Navarro, seems to be at the helm of all of my kids' favorite movies. (laughs) <laughs> the Twi- Twilight movies, I Am Number 4, uh, Pacific Rim, Night at the Museum, Secret of the Tomb, Hellboy. Yeah, I think he's got a solid um, visual style. And I think here, paired with Rennie Harlan, the two of them had a great visual language. I love the you know the real um, low shots you get or the real high shots you get. Or you get that crazy sideways shot when they're in the, um, the train station or wherever mm-hmm. it is. And the assassin comes up to kill uh, Charlie. And you get like this sideways shot as the guy pulls the gun out of his newspaper. It's like so unexpected, out of the blue sort of shot. But it's something that just really stood out. And I I think that Rennie Harlan always kind of puts those things in to really kind of make things stand out a little bit. And I love that Navarro kind of went along with it and just did some really fun stuff with it. You can you really feel Navarro's roots in in this film, I think, in particular. And you know, I guess this was this was the era where he was actually defining his roots, right? Working with Robert Rodriguez on Desperado and Tarantino, uh, and Rodriguez on Dust Till Dawn. And Guillermo um, del Toro. Guillermo del Toro, absolutely. Pan's Labyrinth. Um, he's all over the place. He's actually behind uh, the camera on my. I want to easily one of my top five favorite documentaries 
Uh, have you seen It Might Get Loud? Nope. Oh, p- people, go get this movie. I, I'm almost sure it's streaming on Netflix. It is. Uh, you just take The Edge and Jimmy Page and Jack White and give them guitars and put them in a room together and just see what happens. And it's unreal. It is just great. Wow. Yeah. That sounds cool. Really riveting stuff uh, if you're if you're a music fan. Um, so uh, anyway, he's got a, a really beautiful style, and I think it you, you can kind of see it here. Just how you see who Sam Jackson is going to become as his career progresses, uh, you really feel like I, I, I'm I seeing who this, uh, who Navarro is before he gets to, you know, Pan's Labyrinth and Pacific Rim and, and, uh, um, I think he's he's got a really wonderful creative visual style that I just I really enjoy watching. And and in this movie, which is less you know kind of spectacular uh, in terms of its sort of dreamlike states and no superheroes, it's just very sort of grounded. He still has a way to have a lot of fun with it. And you pair his stuff with uh, Steve M. Davison's stunt uh, coordinating and William Goldenberg's editing. I think all of that stuff pairs really well to just make some over the top uh fun you know yeah. i mean you see a scene like um when they're well like the, going back to the the train station when they're escaping from whatever floor they're on and they jump through the window and yeah. then she takes her gun and uh the machine gun that she picks up and just shoots the ice out yeah so that they have a place to land it's just it's so over the top and nonsensical, but it works so well. And I mean, that's great stunt work. The really fun cinematography through all of that, uh, even the visual effects with the flames like coming from behind them as they're running down the hallway. Uh, all of it's it's just cut together really well. I have so much fun seeing all of that sort of yeah. stuff. The, the team worked really well to kind of put all these elements together. Totally agree. In terms of music, is this one that you put on every now and again? The score, Alan Silvestri's score. I don't. I'm not even sure this one was released. I'd have to check. But I mean, I do like the music. I think it's got some nice themes. I think it's got kind of the nice balance between the the uh, the the lulling tones of Small Town USA and then a little more of the spy sort of stuff going on. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and Alan Silvestri, I mean, you really can't go wrong with him. Uh, did it win anything ever? Any MTV Movie Awards for this one? <laughs> you know, I didn't see any award nominations for this one. Uh, well, I, I take that back. I mean, it was nominated for some small things like Young Artist Award for uh, Yvonne Zima and Image Award for Samuel L. Jackson, Outstanding Lead Actor in a Motion Picture. And Gina Davis did get nominated for a Saturn Award at the Academy of Sci-Fi, Fantasy, and Horror Films. So, I mean, it this got is kind of a weird. That's kind of a weird award for this movie. Yeah, I guess when you look at kind of the the amnesia side of it, uh, I, I guess maybe you could see some of the sci fi or fantasy. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's it is a little funky that it's it's it made it in there, but yeah, it's like The Martian is a comedy, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> Although you'd think the Academy of Sci Fi, Fantasy, and Horror would, would know be a really specific. <laughs> like they would be the specific ones. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But she actually lost to Nev Campbell in Scream. Yeah. Which is a horror film. Which is a horror. So, that's legit. That's legit. So that makes sense. But then again, look at this. Gina Gershon was nominated for Bound, and that is none of those. That's that not sci-fi, those. fantasy, no. or horror. No. It's a le- lesbian organized crime film? Is that a genre? That's what it is. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, and then there's Twister, Fargo. Fargo? Fargo? And The Relic, which is a horror. But why is yes. Fargo in there? Twister? Sure. I, I guess you could call what? that sci-fi. Re- really it's it's fiction and there's she she invents this science? tornado tracker she invents a tornado tracker thing that's that that's is science. not <laughs> legitimate science fiction andy that's science like that they're doing that science that's science fact i've tried that's okay documentary you know, you know what other films were <laughs> you up have the... just made me classify <laughs> twister as a documentary awesome. i hate that you did that other films nominated by the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films this year: Sling Blade. <laughs> okay, as a, I guess as a horror. I guess I mean he does kill somebody, but I don't know. I mean a lot of them actually do make sense. Independence Day, Star Trek: First Contact, The Frighteners. Yeah. Um, but then Primal Fear, Edward Norton. No, I don't. I that this is clearly a tough year for yeah. nominations. It's and Fargo. I mean, that one really blows yeah. me away. It's like, what, what in there is any of those? I mean, sure, there's murders and stuff, but it's not like it's horror. Yeah, it's not horror. 
Uh, anyway, we've derailed with the Saturn Awards. It is, it, it is Minnesota, <laughs> and maybe that's just a science fiction landscape. They they seem like crazy aliens. There's no way that place could possibly exist. <laughs> that's <laughs> Must exactly be it. So <laughs> uh, Listen to how they talk. They are aliens. They uh, this thing was. I also read that this. They've been trying to get this going as a sequel. Well, consider they've been trying since 2007. I don't know if their no chances are soon. very good. No time soon. And I know Shane Black was pushing to get it made into a cable series. But now he has gotten such a busy slate because I think of Iron Man 3 that I don't know if uh, he's even pushing this anymore. It's certainly not on his IMDb page as something that he's is, he's really working on. Because he's got, I mean, he's got like three or four features lined up right now that he's writing and directing. Well, uh, that all that is nonsense compared to our my now, once again, favorite site on our show notes, which is... The <laughs> Internet Movie Firearms Database. Oh, yeah. Tell me, dear Andy, what did you uncover for our, for our pleasure tonight? This one this one certainly uh, takes the cake of the films that we're talking about in the Shane Black series. This has the most weapons. <laughs> this has nine varieties of pistols, four varieties of revolvers, nine varieties of submachine guns and machine pistols, six varieties of rifles and carbines, a shotgun, and a grenade. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this film. A it's, grenade. Uh, that's right. The uh, in the a pear tree. <laughs> uh, that's oh, pretty good. Good stuff. That good is pretty stuff. good. Well, yep. uh, this was uh, this was this was a good watch. And I again, it is redemptive in our series of Shane Black movies. It was a lot of fun to watch, and I'm so glad that <laughs> I'm so glad I liked it better than the the last film that we did. Uh, So my hope is that what you're going to tell me is it actually performed pretty well. Well, I wish. uh, You know, it's interesting. This film, I mean, considering what they spent on it, I mean, this is the problem. It made its money back. Um, it cost, this film came out October 11th, 1996. It cost $65 million in 1996 dollars, which is about $96 million in today's dollars. So that's a, that is a pretty penny. I couldn't find anything on prints and advertising. I have a feeling that would affect this greatly. Um, domestically, it made about $33 million and internationally about $56 million. So all told, it made adjusted about $132 million. So it ended up making adjusted about 300000 back per finished minute. So it made its money back. Now, here's, here's the rub. They paid the writer $4 million to write this script. Yeah. What happened here? This was kind of this peak of this crazy time when they were uh, where spec screenplays were big and they were willing to pay a lot of money for specs. There are still some specs out there that were paid uh, that were they paid uh, ridiculous amounts of money for that have still yet to have been made. Um, and it's it's a very interesting thing that uh, that I mean, geez, David Kep sold a screenplay back in. Um, uh, the, I think it was sometime in the late, or no, the mid-90s, called the Superconducting Super Collider of Sparkle Creek, Wisconsin. He was paid uh, $2.5 million, and still, that has never been made. Wow. Um, and I think that's what happened, is is films um, that people bid on to and paid lots of money for just could never get off the ground. And films that they paid a lot of money for like this, they got off the ground, but then they didn't do the job that the studio felt it should have done. If you're going to pay $4 million for a script, you want it to make bank for you. You're really kind of betting the house that you know, this is going to be the big hand. And it just wasn't. I mean, sure, they, they still made some money, but it wasn't the money they wanted to make. Because of this, Shane Black's power in Hollywood really kind of collapsed quite a bit. And it really kind of kept him out of the game for a long time, for nearly a decade. He was kind of just, uh, he had disappeared. And it's it's really because of this. Well, let's just say, thank God he had that $4 million. Yeah, right. I mean, he, he had I, made that, that was money. That was me being sarcastic. Well, he had made plenty of money. He wasn't hurting. Right. As a as yes. a creative professional in the multimedia arts, let me just say, <laughs> thank God for Shane Black's $4 million spec sale. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, but I, I we're going to kind of take a, a, a nice little break and, and come back on our next movie with uh, uh, 
after his return. So it'll be uh, nice to kind of jump across that. I am looking forward to that one. But in the meantime, Andy, we should probably rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. Sign in at, to your next reel movies account because uh, you know you have one and search for The Long Kiss Goodnight and get ready because we're going head to head. Filmo a filmo. And we're going to see where The Long Kiss Goodnight ranks in our 200, over 200 films that we've talked about so far. Let's see. Is it going to break the top half? I, well, wager, I wager it will. Where do we start? Uh, it, it, it's going to be the O Brother block again. Long oh. Kiss Goodnight or O Brother Where Art Thou? I'm with Long Kiss Goodnight. You are. I am. I really have just an absolute ball watching this. And if I were to have the two sitting in front of me, it's the one that I would put on. It, it, as much as I love O Brother, these films are both very high on my list. This is this is not this is going to disappoint you. And I I want to tell you this. I want to tell you honestly. I want to get it out there up front. I'm going to take you out of the mat on this one because I legitimately would watch O Brother first. Well, and that's fine. But deep down, I hope you win. <laughs> are you, Are you ready? I like that. Sure, right. I'm ready. Okay. One, one two, two, three, three scissors. scissors. Oh, Andy, that was like an open door for rock. (laughs) Well, if I knew that, I would have said rock. (laughs) Oy vey. All right, the long kiss, good night. I don't know, man. (laughs) Did did that just blow it for you for the night? Yes, everything's ruined. (laughs) Oh, ruined. No, I'll be okay. Long kiss, good night, or the sandlot? I'm definitely long kiss. Long kiss, good night, sir. All right, next up, The Long Kiss Goodnight or King's Row? Totally Long Kiss Long Goodnight. Long Kiss Goodnight. The Long Kiss Goodnight or A League of Their Own. Oh, oh what are you going to do some there? Gina Davis uh, battle here. I'm doing The Long Kiss Goodnight, baby. Me too. I, and I absolutely love A League of Their Own, but um, this is just like a level of fun that I really have with this. The Long Kiss Goodnight or The Asphalt Jungle? Um, the long kiss good night. Yep, I'm long kiss good night too. The long kiss good night or Carrie. Uh, definitely the long kiss good night. Yeah, I'll say long kiss good night. The long kiss good night or the bad seed. I'm well, definitely oh, long kiss good night. Long kiss good night. <laughs> All right, the long kiss good night or a stagecoach. Totally long. Kiss yeah, good long night. kiss good night. You know where that's putting this, buddy? Right, right above, oh brother. <laughs> right below, yeah. It's uh, it it'll be another. We'll either have an oh brother or long kiss block now, as opposed to stagecoach. All right. So that puts it at number one twenty on our list. All right. So I feel it should be higher, but that's okay. It, it it's a legit block, though, Andy. I mean, oh brother I, exists there for a reason. <laughs> I can see your point. All right. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I, I can see your point. I am sorry. I am legitimately sorry. You, it really pains me. <laughs> it's okay. It's totally okay. Because if it had crossed O Brother, it would have just not gotten any farther. Because the next one above O Brother is Hot Fuzz. And I would put you would, Hot you Fuzz would on have, yeah. this. <laughs> okay. Then so I it's really close to where yeah. it probably belongs. So All right. I, I, I feel okay with the 120. Okay. All right. What does this do for your uh, letterboxed? Uh, letterbox.com slash the next reel. Uh, what does it do for your star rating over there? I am four out of five. I, I'm going to give you four out of five on that. All right. Yeah. That's what I like to hear. Yeah. So this is so far our highest ranked Shane Black script oh, or Shane Black film that we've talked about. Now I, I will say this may be impacted by the last two films that we didn't like as much. Definitely impacted by the last one. Again, it, this was a major relief. But I still think this is, you know, he, this may be Black, Shane Black goggles. <laughs> I don't think so. I you don't mean, think so? I, well, I've watched this enough times. to. And I mean, I, this is probably the film that Shane Black has done that I have watched more than any other. And it could just be me because I legitimately love this film. I mean, mm-hmm. I have so much fun watching it. And sometimes I, I question why I would give it four stars. But I, I feel like, you know, there, there are issues with it. Um, but... I don't know. I have so much fun watching this film that I think it's uh, I think it's in the right spot well, as far as my star rating. The thing, the thing is here, and, and I think this is an important thing to note, is next week we are talking about uh, we're, we're talking about Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. 
Next week is Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Yes, the, that is the film that uh, returned Shane Black to us after his long uh, disappearance, and he came back in 2005, writing and directing with Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. How much? I can't. Uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't even want to ask. I don't want to know right now, but I just want to say it out loud. I really, really can't wait to talk about this movie. I can't either. Really, really can't wait. No, it's uh, it's uh, going to be a fun conversation. I feel like this Shane Black series is really going up. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it is definitely going up. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, that's fine. That's good. I just wanted to make sure it's going up from here because it's... Okay, I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> Take it back. Let's start it back up. You must zip it. Back up. Do we have anything else going on uh, uh, in addition to uh, the regular show next week? Before we get to Kiss Kiss Bang Bang next week, we are having our uh, our next speakeasy <gasps> coming up. It's going to be our May speakeasy. We're talking with sound mixer Michael B. Koff, and we're talking about a wonderful film, Snatch. Oh, Snatch. I Okay. A, love this movie. B, love coffee. That was a great conversation and cannot wait to introduce him to you all. This was it's going to be great. All right. Absolutely. All right, uh, Andy. God, got so much going on. I feel like I need to go to bed. All right. Well, I got to. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, fooey. I burned the damn muffins. Amazon giveth, Andy. Amazon giveth. Mine comes courtesy of Path- Patherson. 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 <laughs> Patherson. Uh, format VHS tape. This was an, an old school. I uh, watched June twelfth, two thousand. One out of five stars. Calling this film a ridiculous spectacle of free violence. This movie is a shame. I'm sorry that Jackson is in it because he's a great actor, even when make brainless and entertaining movies as Deep Blue Sea. But in this one, everything is cliche. The action is over stereo, over steo hyped, over stifed, over steo typhed, over steo typhed. Davis doesn't convince any time as a hard woman. The dialogues are outrageous, ludicrous. It's a lousy film from beginning to end. Now, I don't know where you stand on the over-steotyping of action. <laughs> the over-steotyping action. I've never seen that before, and I struggled <laughs> I struggled with that word. Um, I'm not sure it exists, even now that I've committed to it. You know but, what I think uh, is... You know what I will say about that that I think is funny? <laughs> Please. Is, <laughs> which is it, it, half serious. Shane Black was brought in to do rewrites on The Last Action Hero, the Last Action Hero was written as a spoof of the type of action scripts that Shane Black was putting out. So I think it's very funny that he ended up getting hired to basically amp it up and bring in the <laughs> Shane Black action into this film that was spoofing Shane Black action. So I could say, okay, I could see over stereotyped. Yes, okay. <laughs> Whatever that is. I'll give it to I, you. I can see, you know, why somebody could say that. But at the same time, I think that there's this Rennie Harlan uh, and Shane Black non-seriousness about the action here that works really well. Yeah. All right. So take that, Patherson. Take that, Patherson. Okay. Well, I have a one-star got? review by Jeremy Mann. Jeremy. It's not Jeremy. It's, I think it's just Jeremy. Jeremy Mann. Jeremy Mann. One of the dumbest movies I've ever seen. He says, watching it on DVD in 2005. First off, Gina Davis is not an actress. She's eye candy and that's about it. Ouch. Much like Kelly LeBrock from back in the 80s. Also, why in the world would you cast a great actor like Samuel L. Jackson in such a lame, blow-up, beat-em-up, make-no-sense action picture? He's way too genuine for such a goofy flick. Go watch Snakes on a Plane. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Gina is super spy woman who hits a deer with a car, gets mad, then breaks its neck, single-handedly takes down loads of villains with machine guns, and also breaks their necks as well. Cheese, cheese, cheese. And although a lot of the action scenes were well executed, it doesn't save this from being a major flop that you'll find for $5.99 in your DV discount bin at Walmart. Yeesh. Well, Gina Davis yeah. can't act? Yeah, no, I feel like we're, we've are we missed something. Does he know that he, she won an Oscar? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I don't think, think, I don't think Jeremy Man on Man knows that. <laughs> I don't man. think Jeremy Man knew that, no. Thanks, Amazon. <laughs> it is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. <laughs> you see what, I, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright's series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read. <laughs>